that we'll have this introductory course to solar system formation, focusing on aspects that concern particularly the solar system, but also introducing general concepts. And in the afternoon, Sean Raymond will elaborate on uh, the extrasolar planetary systems, discussing why they are so often so different from our system, so discussing alternative evolutionary path that can stem, come out of, uh, of the basic, uh, basic laws that govern planet formation. So, of course, solar system formation is a vast subject. I have a lot of time, three hours, but even that is not enough. So I made a choice in agreement with Sean. So, and I will uh, touch about these subjects and these subjects only. So I will speak first about planetesimal accretion which has been a long-lasting mystery for many, many decades, on which we have finally some breakthrough, but it's still an open issue of research. Then the formation of protoplanets, so the cores of the giant planets, or the sub-Earth uh, planetary embryos that eventually made uh, origin, uh, gave origin to the system of terrestrial planets, as we know. I would like to make a connection with cosmochemical constraints and uh, show how we can explain them in the context of planetesimal and protoplanet formation introducing this concept of Jupiter barrier as you will see and then we will speak uh, properly about the giant the formation of the giant planets in our system and their migration the formation of the terrestrial planets and the last stage which gave to the solar system the structure that we know today so because it's a long uh, uh, it's, 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 it's a long subject I would suggest that if you don't understand something that uh, is a block for you to understand uh, what will follow, ask a break, break me down and ask the questions directly because if you wait for three hours, and it will be too late. If instead it's more of a curiosity, uh, you ask for some uh, digression and so on, we can do that at the end. And apparently because Frank Celsius is not here this afternoon, after Sean's uh, lecture, we will come back together and then uh, we will have a sort of open session of questions and, and answers so where you can uh, ask whatever makes you curious. But if you have uh, really comp questions that concern the understanding of what I'm telling, please stop me and ask right away. <laughs> so uh, I think everybody knows that uh, planets form in protoplanetary disks when the star forms. Uh, the collapse of gas towards the central star necessarily creates a disk structure around by conservation of angular momentum. It was predicted a long time ago, for instance, by Laplace. It's now routinely observed when we image young uh, stars in uh, stellar associations. And this disk, so-called protoplanetary disk, is made most of gas, but also of particles, solid particles, and the mass ratio between the gas and the particles is roughly 100 to 1, but this may depend on the chemistry of the star. The dust initially is very small, it can be micron in size, or even smaller than a micron in size. And, but then of course the, the particles can uh, collide and start to stick to each other, as I will show in the next slide. And, uh, what do the particles and what do the gas? What does the gas? So the gas globally is uh, uh, has a motion that is slowly drives the gas towards the central star. This is why a protoplanetary disk is also called an accretion disk. Gas keeps flowing in the disk and feeds the star and we can measure the stellar accretion rate using spectroscopy. So we know that's true. It's not just an issue of mod. Why gas flows towards the central star? It's a big issue. To flow towards the central star, it needs to lose angular momentum. And how it loses angular momentum is an open issue that uh, people are not uh, ready to solve. And I will not speak about that. It's not really my, my subject of research. What, do the, what does the dust do? So the dust, first of all, settles towards the mid-plane. So like, uh, you know, if you have particles in a, in a glass of water, then these particles slowly go to the bottom. And, uh, but in the disk probably has some level of turbulence, even if the turbulence in disk is not well characterized. And the turbulence tends to stir the mid-plane layer of dust. Uh, like if you uh, put uh, a spoon in, in your cup uh, and you mix, of course, the, the particles that you have in your, in your cup will not all sediment to the bottom. So depending on how much turbulence you have, you get a sort of dust distribution, more or less concentrated on the mid-plane of the disk, 
<laughs> but so the dust distribution is not equal to the gas distribution, and it's more concentrated on the midplane. And in addition, dust particles also migrate towards the central star because of gas drag, and I will come to that because this is a very important point. So how does dust stick? There is a lot of uh, laboratory work about uh, how particles can stick together to form bigger and bigger objects and eventually maybe possibly planetesimals. So particles initially are very small. So monomer monomers can be micrometer in size, sometimes even less. And when they collide by random walking in the gas, they can stick mostly by electrostatic forces. And this builds some uh, um, small structures, microscopic structures, but still well below the millimeter in size, which are very fractal. And uh, then what you can have collisions between these uh, fractal structures, and the fate of these collisions depends on the energy at which these structures come together. And this can be very well simulated in the lab. And by the way, to get rid of the terrestrial gravity, which of course would compromise the experiments, most of these experiments are done in drop, drop towers. And the best lab in Europe about that is in Braunschweig in, in, uh, in Germany. And so by doing the experiment in a drop tower, you can measure what the particles actually do during the, the free fall, and so in, during which gravity, Earth gravity is cancelled out. So what is observed and, and is that for low energy, if you have two fractal structures coming together, well, they form a just a bigger fractal structure, more or less keeping the same porosity. But then when you start to increase the energy, you have some restructuring, which typically leads to some compaction, reduction of the porosity, reduction of this fractal dimension. But then if you exceed, continue to increase the uh, kinetic energy of the impact, you start to have breakups. And uh, if the energy of collision is large enough, Basically, everything is destroyed, and the monomers are restituted free into space. So the question is, what are the energies of collisions that we should expect? And so are we in this regime, and how big are the particles can, that can build in this kind of regime? And when do we transit into this regime? And so accretion stops, and we go back to disruption. Uh, so. Uh, we, need to, we need to compute the kinetic energy of the collision. How can we do that? So the, ki the kinetic energy can depend on two things. So the, um, the motion of these uh, this aggregates, and this can be due to well, the, the, uh, the, the, the thermal properties in the disk. Right? You know, the, the, that's related to the temperature in the disk. Can be due to the turbulence in the disk that unfortunately we don't know very well, but can also be due to uh, differential speed of migration towards the star. And so we need uh, to discuss the migration of grains because this is the most important concept to compute what is the energy with which two particles or two aggregates of particles uh, can collide with each other. So this is a scheme and I should clarify things. So you have the sun and you have a dust particle and the dust particle is in orbit around the sun. So it moves at a speed v so that the gravitational force exerted by the sun on the particle is exactly equal to the centrifugal force due to the, the, the motion. Now if you take a gas molecule, it's the same thing. So the gas molecule will move around the sun, in orbit around the sun with a speed v. So that, so that its centrifugal force uh, counterbalances the force that it feels from the sun. But here there is a difference. The force that it feels from the sun is the gravitational force. So for a, for a volume of gas at the same location of the particle, it will be the same gravitational force. But it's a gas. So a gas is also feeling its own pressure. And because in general, the structure of a protoplanetary disk is that it's, there is higher density of gas closer to the star and fewer, lesser and lesser, smaller and smaller density of gas further away from the sun. There is a pressure gradient. And the pressure gradient in this direction exerts a force, which is a radial force, like the gravity force, but has the opposite sign. So the actual force that, by which the sun attracts an element of gas 
is the difference between the gravitational force and this pressure force. So this force, total resulting force, will be smaller than the one that the dust particle feels, which means that the centrifugal force required to balance it has to be smaller, which means that the velocity of the gas in orbit around the star has to be smaller. So the dust particle tend to be, tends to move faster than a fluid element. And this, of course, exerts a drag. There is a difference, velocity difference, between the particle and the gas. And this velocity difference, which is a fraction of the Keplerian speed, and this fraction is typically indicated with the letter eta, uh, is directed against the particle motion. So the particle is slowed down as it moves. That's why we speak of gas drag. And if you slow down something in orbit, it doesn't simply orbit less fast, but the laws of celestial mechanics say that if you slow down something in orbit, it starts to spiral towards the central object. It's what happens, for instance, to artificial satellites. When they start to be dragged in the atmosphere, they start to fall down. And, and if they don't have rockets that systematically lift back uh, the, the, the spacecraft, uh, the closest spacecraft to the Earth inevitably fall on Earth. And this would be the fate of the ISS as well if it were not lifted every few months. So uh, because of this drag, particles spiral to the Sun. And in the next slides, of course, I will uh, neglect the rotational motion because it takes many rotations to move to the Sun. But I will just uh, sketch the radial migration. But the particle doesn't migrate boom, directly into the Sun like, as if it were in free fall. It's actually a very slow spiral. Question. Yes? You said in the beginning that you didn't know how the dust lost uh, angular momentum. The gas, gas. The gas lost angular yeah. momentum. Yeah, the gas. The gas is weird, right? Because the gas has to lose angular momentum to fall in. Be, but it, so in order to lose angular momentum, some gas has to lose, is lose it and some other has to gain. And uh, what allows to exchange angular momentum is not so clear. So people thought it was viscosity, but the thermal viscosity, the molecular viscosity, way too small. So we were looking for turbulent viscosity, arguing that disks are very turbulent. Now, all this recipe for turbulent disks uh, now <laughs> fell to pieces. And uh, indeed, observations don't detect any turbulence in disks, only upper limits. And now there are new models in which there are magnetic winds that can accelerate molecules of gas from the surface of the disk and shooting it into interstellar space. And this removes angular momentum from the overall disk, allowing some, dust, some gas to go to the star. But it's a complicated and process, not an expert, and it's all changing all the time. So I'll, because, because it's really active research. So that's why I decided not to speak much about it. But for the dust, there is no mystery. This is just gas drag. And even if the gas did not move, were perfectly in orbit, the dust would migrate nevertheless. <laughs> okay. Um, so, as I was saying, so you, the, the, par the particle spiders to the sun, I will just highlight the radial motion. Okay. Uh, so, it can be computed how fast a, a grain uh, of a given size migrates towards the sun. And for instance, this slide is taken from a work of 1977 by Wyden Schilling. It's for the radial migration of dust at 30 U, but it can be computed at any place. And as you can see, this is the result. So here you have the size of the particles, and here you have the velocity. So let's interpret the qualitative feature of this curve. So this qualitative feature can be interpreted as, as it follows. So for very small particles, very small particles, uh, talking about 10 to minus 4 centimeters, are uh, so light that they are extremely coupled with the gas. So they move with the gas. And, uh, and so they, they, because they move with the gas, the radial, the, the radial force, the, 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 the friction force they feel is much weaker, and so the radial motion is very small. Essentially, it's like having a gas particle. For very larger bodies, and here we are, uh, planetesimals that are a few kilometers or tens of kilometers in size, of course, gas drag does not um, affect much the body because the body is a big mass and the gas is very tenuous. And so, and so of course, also, they are also in this case, it's very hard to move something just by the friction with the gas. In between, 
you have an intermediate uh, particle size of a few centimeters to a meter, which is where the, instead the friction is optimal. And here you have the highest effect, which induces radiation uh, migration speeds, which can be very high, of the order of 10 to the 4 centimeters per second. And this is, uh, this is a lot, it's a fraction of a kilometer per hour. Right? and uh, 0.1 kilometers per hour. So these particles really move in the disk very, very fast. So because the velocity of migration depends on the size of the particles, you understand that if you have two particles of two different sizes, they migrate to the sun with different speeds. And so when they collide, they will have a relative speed. Okay? And this relative speed is the one we need in order to evaluate the fate of these collisions that I showed you before are kinetic energy dependent. And this is what has been done in a number of works. And uh, I use these slides from Windmark et al, which remain still very updated. So what is, this, <coughs> what is this plot? This plot shows as a function of target size and projectile size, what happens to the collision of these two particles. And of course, there is subjection to this, another diagram, which I'm not, show, not showing, which gives the velocity of mutual encounter, which is computed given the difference in size and adding a little bit of turbulence. So the colors show what's going on. So when you have dark green, green light, S means sticking. So if you are in the dark green regime, two particles, projectile and, and target, when they hit, they stick together, and so you have net growth. When you have this intermediate green is SB, so it's stick and bounce. So not 100% of the projectile really sticks to the target, but some of it does. Some of it jumps, breaks, and jumps off. But so you still have a net gain in the target mass. Yellow means bounce, B. And when you have a bounce, the projectile comes, hits the target, and bounces off and there is no net grain gain to the target. Maybe the target accretes a little bit of the projectile, but on the other hand, the projectile damages the target a little bit. And so the net mass exchange is zero. And then if you have E, uh, so red, that's erosion. It's like cratering. The target, the projectile comes in and breaks part of the target. The target loses mass. So instead of growing, it shrinks. And if you have F, fatal, Fragmentation means that the collision is so energetic that, that your target is pulverized and the largest particle that remains is less than half of the original mass of your target. So as you can see, there is a diagonal line. So this diagonal line is always a little bit, at least until these sizes, it's always a little bit better than the surroundings. That's because if two particles have the same size, that minimizes the collision speed. But as soon as you change the size, you go, for instance, to some target and some much smaller projectile, you think it's worse. You worf, worse. You go from um, sticking to sticking and bounce, for instance. Why? Because the relative speed of collision increases because the difference in size and the difference in uh, migration speed. So what, does, what this diagram shows is that small particles can effectively grow, sticking or sticking and losing a little bit. And but then when you reach the domain of a millimeter, maybe a centimeter, you enter in the bounce regime. And there, the, your particles don't grow anymore. If you bombard them, they, they, they don't accrete the mass. They just bounce off. Now, you could say that if you are lucky, and maybe some particle, for some reason, manages to get a large enough size, maybe tens of centimeters, then it can enter in this regime, where it can accrete very small particles and keep growing. But as soon as it encounters another particle with a reasonable, non-negligible size, it's eroded or collisionally fragmented. So it's very hard to grow a significant number of particles towards the larger sizes. And basically, we expect that the disk is left with a collection of solid grains of about a millimeter in size in the inner part of the disk. And in the outer part of the disk, where ice, where water is in the form of ice, things are a little bit better than shown in this figure. One can do another figure uh, because ice is more sticky. And it seems that particles can reach a few centimeters up to decimeter in size. But then you enter in, again into the bouncing and fragmentation problem. 
There are some uh, alternative models developed in Japan about trying to form extremely fluffy kilometer size aggregates, or done by Okozumi et al. This is a sort of uh, non orthodox view of planetesimal formation and still has to be demonstrated that it really works, so I will not speak any further about it. But the fact, that, for instance, that in the inner solar system, we can grow grains up to a millimeter in size and not much more, more maybe up to a fraction of a centimeter, is actually correct. Because if you take a meteorite, a chondrite, so you know what it is made of because it didn't melt, and you break it open, then you find that, I have a slide that is later, then you find that the components of the meteorites are chondrules and uh, CAIs, so minerals that have been uh, formed uh, in the disk uh, in some, uh, some high temperature condition. But these minerals all have sizes of the order of a millimeter, sometimes a little bit more, sometimes a little bit less. You never find in a meteorite a chunk of 15 centimeters made of something. Right? So this, this idea that growth by sticking can uh, lead only to millimeter sized particles at least in the inner part of the disk, really looks correct. But of course, uh, it's shocking because we need to form planetesimals, and we do know there are planetesimals that are called asteroids and comets that are even there today, so somehow they formed. And then from the planetesimals, you need to form the planets. So if the growth in a protoplanetary disk ends at the millimeter size scale, well, we have something to understand. So for decades, Actually, the community has been more or less lost by how can we build big things. And that was quite embarrassing because on one, on one side we were talking about the rest of planet formation, moon forming event, and so on. Well, how do the planet test move? I don't know. Uh, but uh, we, now the situation is improving. Now the situation is improving. There is a new class of models which are very promising, not totally fully. Uh, complete, so there is a lot of work still to do in this framework, but they give a hope that we have a hint of how big things form. And the idea is the one of the streaming instability. It's a concept that I will uh, sketch so that you can understand, and then I will show how it forms and when, how it works and when it works and the open problems. So again, we said that if you have a particle in a disk of gas, it feels uh, it lives in a disk which rotates around the sun less uh, quickly, and so it feels a headwind, and so it feels a, a, radial, a, a radial motion. But if you have a clump of particles, it will be the same. The clump of particles want to move at the same speed. The gas wants to move at the same speed well, as in the previous case, so a little bit less. But because they are now, the, the gas is pushing the particles, slowing down the particles, but for the action-reaction principle, the particles are speeding up the gas. Right? And if you have only one particle speeding up the gas, the effect is more or less negligible. If you have a clump of particles speeding up the gas, well, the effect is a little bit more than if you have a single particle speeding up the gas. So as a result, the, if, if you are in presence of a clump of particles, the gas moves a little bit faster than the gas where the particle is alone. And so the headwind of speed, eta vk, is a little bit less than the one felt by this particle alone. And so this clump of particles will migrate a little bit more slowly towards the sun. So you are in this situation, you have a clump, a lucky clump of particles, because particles are distributed randomly in the disk, but so not absolutely uniformly. Here you have a, instead an isolated particle. The clump migrates more slowly, the particle migrates more quickly, and it joins the clump. Welcome to the club. Now you have a more massive clump. And a more massive clump will push the gas a little bit more, feeling so a little bit slower headwind and migrating a little bit slower even. So if you have another rogue particle in the disk, and then this one will also catch the clump, and so on and so forth. So your clump has to grow. And this gives rise to an instability where you can concentrate enough dust particles to really influencing the motion of the fluid and eventually even uh, uh, blocking the radial drift towards the star. So this was just a cartoon, but now I will show you a simulation. So before going into this and this, which I will explain later, let's first look at the movie, then I will show you what are the parameters that we need to discuss. So 
what is this plot? So this plot is a piece of the disk. So this is the protoplanetary disk. The sun is at the center. And we are looking here at a little patch in the disk. So the x direction is the radial direction. And so the sun is on the left. And the y direction is the azimuthal direction. So the gas and the particles rotate around the sun in this direction. But the movie will be made in a, rot in, a, in a rotating reference frame. So at zero, the net speed will be zero. And because the disk rotates faster in the inside and slower in the outside, the tendency will be for the motion to be upwards for x less than zero and downwards for x bigger than zero. The color will show the dust to gas ratio. And the initial ratio is uh, 10 to minus 3, and uh, no, 3 10 to minus 2, and it's blue. And as the dust starts to accumulate, uh, it will become uh, more orange, yellow, and so on. So let's start <coughs> the movie. Did it start? Yes. <coughs> so as you can see, as the movie starts, and oops, oh, okay, uh, and uh, the number of orbits is indicated here. You see that the column is not uniform anymore. Now you have a lighter blue that forms some filaments. So these are filaments where we have some accumulation of particles due to this streaming instability I was telling before. And then you have the, that some clumps start to form spontaneously in the disk and they reach higher and higher concentration. And at some point you can have so much dust concentrated locally that the self-gravity of all this dust makes a, a, a compact, a, a coherent structure, a bounded structure that we call a planetesimal. And these white dots that we see here are all planetesimals, and the mass, I think, in this case, is the multiple of some reference mass that I think is a thousand kilometer planetesimal. But okay, it doesn't really matter. And this zoom here shows what happens around this planetesimal. So you see that the planetesimal goes around. It can accrete other clumps, it can accrete other planetesimals, and so on. So you can form some planetesimals, even relatively big, just as self-gravitating clumps of small particles that have been first clustered together by this thinning instability. And once the local density is high enough, the self-gravity keeps the structure together, and then the planetesimal will survive. And then all these particles uh, clumped together will sediment on, them, on themselves to form, to, form, uh, to form a planetesimal. So this is now the leading idea on formation of planetesimals, starting from small particles, the size of which is limited by the bouncing and fragmentation barriers. Now let's see the rest. OK, so these parameters show the parameters used for this animation uh, simulation that um, worked. So this is the um, uh, resolution in the, in the, in the box, uh, 512 cube. Now people can do four times better power cube. Uh, OK, so this is just a technical parameter. It influences a little bit of the results. But the most important are these ones, Z and Tau. Z is the original um, volume ratio uh, between the particles and the gas. So it's initially 3% in this simulation before any clumping starts to occur. So it's already quite high at the very beginning, because as I said, typically for the sun, for instance, the solid to gas ratio is 1%. So here already the authors cheat. By the way, did I quote? Who, and uh, yeah, this is, this is the original of the, the, the movie. The authors cheated a little bit, and declared that, that by starting from a more metallic disk than the actual solar system protoplanetary disk was supposed to be. And then there is another parameter, this tau. What is tau? So when you have gas drag, the law affecting the velocity of the particle <clears throat> has a simple form, which is this one. So the, the acceleration or the deceleration is proportional to the difference between the particle velocity and the gas velocity, this headwind that I was telling you before, times a coefficient, which has the unity of the inversion, the inverse of a time. And so this time is called the friction time. It's a time scale at which the particle would lose completely its velocity, excess of velocity relative to the gas. Then you take this friction time, Tf, 
you normalize it to the orbital time scale. So omega is the, the inverse of uh, the orbital period, is 2p, omega is 2p over the orbital period. And then you get something which is a-dimensional. It's an, an a-dimensional number. And this is to, called the Stokes number. And the Stokes number <clears throat> then, well, depends a little bit what is your drag regime. But in, uh, in, in most cases, which is the Epstein regime, it's related to the density ratio between the particle and the gas. It's proportional to the size of the particle. It's inversional proportional to the sound speed in the gas. And it's uh, related to, to the rotation in, in the disk. So this diagram shows you what is the actual value of the Stokes number as a function of your particle size and as a function of your particle location in AU from the sun. And as a particle of as a, and as a function of the particle size in centimeters. Remember, I told you that coagulation produces millimeter-sized particles and not much bigger. So if you take a millimeter-sized particle, a few times millimeter-sized particle at one AU, tau should be 10 to minus 3, not 1. And if tau is 1, it would mean that we already have in the inner disk sort of meter-sized boulders that I told you before we don't know how to make. Okay. So the simulation is a fake, right? And in a sense, it works, but it works for a set of parameters that don't exist. And, and this is the big issue, and uh, the, 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 the research people working in this field are now trying to see whether the same scheme can occur for more realistic parameters that are relevant for the solar system and probably for any <coughs> protoplanetary disk in the galaxy. So this is the slide I was looking before was again to, stretch, to, uh, to stress that we, we can't cheat on the constituents of the planetesimals because luckily for us, at least for the solar system, we have meteorites. Okay? And this is a slide of a meteorite of a Nell chondrites, and it shows what the meteorite is made of. It's a clear mm, composition of individual particles, okay? which are called chondrules, and some are a little bit bigger, which are called CIs, calcium aluminum inclusions. And the scale, which has disappeared from the figure, uh, is such that, I mean, this guy is probably one centimeter, and these guys are about one millimeter in size. So you don't find anything macroscopic. You don't find the boulder that was needed in the simulation. So we really need to show that uh, the streaming instability works for this kind of small particles. So for a Stokes number of the order of 10 to minus 3 to 10 to minus 2. And uh, so, of course, people have tried that hard. The latest result on this subject is a paper by Young et al. last year, 2016. So what is this? Now, they did uh, improve the, the resolution, used the European supercomputer, and uh, redid the simulations I showed before for a variety of Stokes numbers. Now, not only one, this value quite unrealistic we've seen before, but going towards 10 to minus 3, because that's our holy grail, the, the Stokes number of chondrules. And uh, they still explore the, the parameters of the original uh, mass ratio between the dust and the gas. And remember, for the solar metallicity, the original, before something happens in the disk, before this starts to evolve, we should start from 10 to minus 2. And this boundary is the boundary above which the streaming instability works, so you can produce planetesimals, and below which the streaming instability doesn't work, so you don't produce anything. So for one, you find that the critical ratio between dust and gas is 3%. So it's perfectly consistent what we've seen before for tau 1. For tau 10 to minus 3, so again, chondrules, you need to increase your dust to gas ratio even more, about 4%, so four times the solar metallicity. And uh, this is the best we have today. So it's, this is the state of the art. So unless there is something in the technique of the simulation that makes this boundary too high and the real boundary comes down, but nobody's ever shown that up to now, uh, we need to start thinking about processes that can increase the dust to gas ratio prior to the streaming instability so that we can do something and we can start to form planetesimals. So in the next few slides, I will talk to you about, talk to you about some mechanisms to increase Z, dust to gas ratio, 
so that something can happen. So naively, one could say, well, the gas is accreted by the star. You said that. So the dust to gas ratio will increase because the gas is the dust is accreted by the, the gas is accreted by the star. Well, no, because the gas is accreted by the star, but the dust drifts toward the star too. And if one does the calculation, which is done here in this busy plot, actually the dust ends in the sun more fast than the gas. So with time going on, and you take a viscous evolution of a disk and the migration of the dust in this disk. Well, actually, the gas to dust ratio increases with time instead of, the, or better, the dust to gas ratio decreases with time rather than increasing with time. So we are going the wrong way. So it's not the normal evolution of the disk that would help. But we know that at some point, a disk disappears very fast. And uh, so the disk, protoplanetary disks, this is observed, they live in a few millions of years. And then when they start disappearing, they disappear very fast, in less than a million years, a few hundred thousand years. And this final process of uh, clearing of the disk is presumably photoevaporation. So photoevaporation is due to gas in the surface of the disk being uh, heated uh, by the irradiation of the central star or the stars in the cluster. It becomes ionized. And then following the magnetic uh, line field, it goes away. And typically, this process can remove gas at a speed of about 10 to minus 9, one billionth of a solar mass per year. Yeah, it's pretty large. And so uh, at some point when uh, the gas, um, the flow, mass flow of gas towards the sun uh, wanes, the photoevaporation becomes the dominant process. And what happens is that it erodes the surface density of the disk and dents it and divides the disk in two parts uh, in an inner disk, which is not fed by the outer disk anymore. So it's accreted onto the star very quickly. And an outer disk, which is then blown away once the inner disk goes away. So, and this process so has nothing to do with the emotional gas towards the, the sun. So, and it's very fast. So when you are in a photo evaporation mode, you are removing essentially gas without removing the dust. So this is the moment when your dust to gas ratio can go up to the roof. And this has been uh, particularly modeled in this uh, recent paper by Carrera et al. in Lund, uh, uh, published last year. So this could produce high dust to gas ratios, the kind that of those we need to perform planetesimals. But the problem is that photo evaporation happens only when the disk is dying, so in a late disk, and so after a few million years of lifetime of the disk, this is what the observations tend to indicate. So if all planetesimals have to wait until the, photo, the protoplanetary disk is photo evaporated in order to form its first planetesimals, we would expect that all planetesimals form late, after a few millions of years. How does photo evaporation happen? Yeah, yeah, I, uh, I don't have any slide here. So it's essentially the radiation from the star that illuminates the surface of the disk, and so injects energy on the surface of the disk, and then this dissociates molecules. So it's photonic pressure. Yeah, not real photonic pressure. They, they first you uh, break molecules and create ions, and then it's the coupling with the magnetic field that removes the ionized material. The, the radiation pressure would not be enough to remove anything from the disk. So you need to first ionize, and then it's the magnetic field will do the job for you. There, are very, there is a very nice review on uh, photo evaporation uh, in the protoplanet and protostar 6 volume. So that I encourage you to look at if, if you want to know more about that. So, and this model would argue that all planets was formed late after a few million years because that's when photoevaporation occurs. Is this correct or not? Well, it's partially correct because if you again look at meteorites, the chondrites, so the planet, the meteorites of undifferentiated planetesimals, planetesimals that did not melt, we know they formed late uh, because we can date the, the formation of their chondrules somehow. I will not enter into that. And, but we find that in this meteorite, the chondrules that we find in the meteorites have a variety of ages, but typically between two, and three, between two and three million years after the formation of the sun, which is our time zero here. So if the 
particles that make the meteorites, the chondrites, form two to three million years after the sun. Of course, the chondrite itself must have formed after that. So apparently, the parent bodies, the asteroids, parent bodies of ordinary chondrites formed around three, four million years. That's fantastic, eh? the time of photo evaporation. So that's really encouraging. We might have found a good hint. So wait until the gas is strongly removed by photo evaporation, <laughs> reach high the, the, the solid to gas ratios, and then out of all these chondrules that are in this dying disk, you form the planetism. That's great, but it's only part of the story. Because we don't only, not only have ordinary, uh, sorry, um, chondrites, we also have iron meteorites. And iron meteorites, unlike the chondrites, come from parent bodies that melted and differentiated into an iron core and the silicate mantle. And we can date when that occurred, occur, and we're not entering how that is done. This is a geochemistry, but we know that the, the, these planetesimals are from, from which we get these meteorites today, they formed within a million years. So going back here, we have the chondrules mostly formed between two and three million years. The parent bodies of chondrites there for, must have formed afterwards, say three, four million years. But the parent bodies that send us the iron meteorites formed here. And at that time, there is no photo evaporation possible. So photo evaporation on the disk as a mechanism to increase the solid to gas ratio works well, can explain one class of planetesimals, but we still need something else. We still need a way to increase the dust to gas ratio early on before photo evaporation becomes a relevant process. So how can we do that? Maybe we don't have to do it everywhere in the disk. Maybe we can do it at specific sites. Because after all, we don't know where these iron meteorites come from. They come from some parent body, which is today in the asteroid belt. But the asteroid belt, as we will see in the second part of the lecture, it's a mess. So we don't know where these bodies form. Maybe they form all at the same place. So we can try to look for mechanisms that enhance the solid to gas ratio, maybe locally. And locally, this can be done if we can pile up the particles. So how can we pile up the particles? Well, a simple math formula, the surface density of the par particles, of the pebbles, let's call pebbles these uh, uh, solid grains, will be is equal to their mass flux towards the sun divided by their radial velocity. Okay. So if you want to pile up stuff, so increase uh, sigma of, of the solids, you need that this term, 1 over Rv, Rvr, decreases faster than the surface density profile of the gas, which is typically 1 over R, okay, to some power alpha, but which is typically 1. Okay. So let's write this velocity. It's something like that. So it depends essentially on the Stokes number and depends on the, how subcaplerian is the disk, eta Vk. And then there are little other terms, but that they are less dominant. So if you want to enhance Pb, sigma of the solids, we need to decrease, make, have Vr really small somewhere. How can I do it? How can I have Vr really small somewhere? The first possibility is that eta becomes very small. What does it mean? It means that dust accumulates where the gas is no longer subcaplerian. And where is the gas no longer subcaplerian? At an edge. Typically, a disk surface density of gas is a power law, or maybe a power law whose, which, whose exponent changes with the distance. And as long as it is a decreasing function, there is a pressure gradient, so the disk is subcaplerian, as I said before, and eta is some non-negligible value. But close to the star, uh, there may be various phenomena related to the, the magnetic field of the star that actually deplete the inner disk and create, so the density of gas very close to the star drops. This is called the inner edge of the disk. And uh, when the, the density drops, that means that the, the density gradient or the pressure gradient are reversed. And here at the maximum, there is no pressure gradient. And so eta will be zero. So that means that par solid particles will migrate, 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 will come here and will stop migrate. And so they will accumulate here. So at the inner edge of the disk, we have a preferential spot where we can accumulate stuff. And then once we reach enough the solid to gas ratio, as we know, 
we can do the streaming instability. Typically, so this inner edge of the disk is very, very close to the star. There are some models, we don't know if they are true or not, in some specific uh, evolutions of disk due to disk wind and so on, where the location of this maximum can move outwards with time. And so in this case, we could have accumulation of particles even at distances of the order of 1 AU or few AU, but we are not sure that this disk evolution with a maximum so far out is actually real. Another possibility is that, well, eta is uniform, but uh, nevertheless, the radial dependence of VR is, uh, is steep enough that sigma, the, the, there is a pile up of solids in the inner part of the disk. And this is because the Stokes number is a function of the location, right? If you put uh, omega and uh, CS and the density of the gas all is a function of radial distance from the sun, you find that the Stokes number decreases like r to the a, where a is the exponent of the surface density of the gas, which is 1 over ra. So basically, you expect that the ratio between dust to gas increases as 1 over r, the distance from the sun, power 1 half. So the closer you go to the star, the more dust you find relative to the gas. And in addition, if you take into account coagulation, bouncing, fragmentation, you can have even more pronounced pileups. And in a very interesting paper two years ago, Dranskowska et al. at ETH in Zurich modeled all of this, and they found that indeed the ratio between dust to gas can change widely over time. So initially you start from a ratio which is 10 to minus 2 everywhere, and then as time progresses, you have a slight depletion of dust in the outer part and an accumulation of dust in the inner part. And then this, as time progresses, becomes more pronounced and then even more pronounced, and then everything disappears. Yeah? Because both the ga gas is flushed into the star, the star and the dust as well. So you can uh, reach the conditions for the streaming instability locally at some distance from the star in this model, just inwards of 1 AU, between half and 1 AU. And there you can form planetesimals relatively quickly because these piles up are pretty fast. They take less than a million years to occur. And, uh, and so there, these could be the way in which an early generation of planetesimals could form. And other people have worked on another second place in the disk where you could have a local pileup of solids relative to the gas and therefore an early formation of planetesimals via the streaming instability. And this is at the snow line, the snow line being the location beyond which water can be in the form of ice and within which water is vapor in the form of vapor because the disk is too warm. So all of these models, of course, are preliminary models. They have some assumptions. They have some parameters. They are discussed in the literature. They certainly need to be explored further. But the, the view that is emerging from all this work is that maybe the formation of the early planetesimals in a disk occurs according to a paradigm like this. So early on, you can form planetesimals via the streaming instability only at selective sites. And two of these sites have been uh, identified. One could be the inner part of the protoplanetary disk, maybe as close as the inner edge, or maybe inwards of 1 AU or about 1 AU, where exactly it is will depend on the parameter of your disk that we don't know very well. And the other one is uh, just beyond the snow line or even a little bit within the snow line, but close to the snow line. Elsewhere, you don't have the conditions for the streaming instability to operate because the dust to gas ratio is too low. And there, there is only one thing you can do, wait until photoevaporation happens. And when photoevaporation happens, then you can do planetesimals everywhere. So basically, you have early planetesimal formation, a specific site in the disk, and the rest, where nobody could do anything, will form planetesimals later on. And that so will happen in the, in the asteroid belt, in the Kuiper belt, and so on. And this view, for what we know, may be correct. So this, the geochemistry constraints from the meteorite record, from the analysis of KBOs, most of which don't seem to be differentiated, seem to really argue that something like that happened. 
Of course, this is just a qualitative view. We need to be refined in decades of modeling, but I think we are going towards, towards this view. Okay, so we have various genera two generations of planetesimals. Planetesimals that form early necessarily differentiate because if a planetesimal forms early, it has a lot of radioactive elements that decay, uh, some very quickly, like aluminum 26. This is a so sufficient source of heat to differentiate the bodies. If the bodies form late, most aluminum 26 is gone. There is not enough energy to melt the planetesimal. So a first approximation, when we look at an asteroid or a KBO, and we see it's differentiated like Vesta. It's not differentiated like, uh, like uh, well, Pluto doesn't seem even to be differentiated and nowadays. So but then we can say, okay, this guy formed really early, this guy formed really late. And then if you really know, want to know when the body formed, you need to have the samples like for the meteorite. Uh, one last slide on uh, the streaming instability. What kind of bodies do you form with the streaming instability actually? So the movie that I showed at the beginning, uh, was pro producing even larger bodies, more massive than, than series. But actually, more modern simulations that are high resolution, that tend to do a statistics on the size of these clumps that are formed, seem to show that planetesimals are formed with the characteristic size, which depends on some parameters of the disk, like the scale height of the disk, uh, the typical Stokes numbers of your grains, and so on. But it's of the order of 100 kilometers give or take a factor of two. And uh, what we see when we look at the populations of planetesimals that are left in the solar system to help us, which are the asteroids and the Kuiper belt, and we look at their size distribution. So this is the cumulative number of bodies as a function of size. So for instance, for the asteroid belt, <laughs> the size distribution is pretty steep for bigger bodies bigger than 100 kilometers. And then it's shallower for bodies smaller than 100 kilometers, and you have a tail. For the Kuiper belt, it's the same. So unfortunately, I did not put, did not have a diagram showing size here, but the absolute magnitude. But so it means big bodies are here, small bodies are here. And again, you have a steep distribution, and then it shallows off a little bit. So you have a bump again at a magnitude that corresponds to about 100 kilometers in size. These tails seem to be at collisional equilibrium, so are probably fabricated by the four billion years of collisions between the asteroid, among the asteroids or among the KBOs. So this really suggests that most of the original planetesimals formed with a characteristic size of about 100 kilometers. So this is important to know. It's a big paradigm shift compared to original theories. In original models, people were imagining that you, know, you have the dust, the dust coagulates, form aggregates, the aggregates coagulate, form uh, things this big. Then they coagulate, they form little planetesimals, they coagulate from long, bigger planetesimals, and they coagulate and form planets. No. Uh, the new models is this basically you have grain sticking, you reach this millimeter size in the, in the hot part, silicate part of the disk, and centimeters in the icy part of the disk. And then these particles live like individual particles until they find the clump. Uh, this clump becomes massive enough to become self gravitating. And these self-gravitating clumps typically lead to 100 kilometer planetesimals, no, no smaller. Uh, smaller planetesimals should be, maybe some exist, but should be in a relatively smaller number. And very massive planetesimals from the very beginning should also be a minority. Probably some exist, but should be a minority. So we have uh, a view, okay, with uh, not extremely consolidated, but now we have a view on how planetesimals may form. The planetesimals are not planets. Right? So as I said, 100 kilometers, well, it's not really what we would like to have to explain planet formation. Even if some can be a 1,000 kilometers, it's still much smaller than Earth or the core of Jupiter. So we now go to the second step of accretion, which is uh, the passage, the transition from a planetesimals to protoplanets. So where were we? We were with the streaming instability forming some planetesimals in a disk made of gas and particles, pebbles. So, but once the planetesimal is made, it still is in this disk of gas and, and <coughs> particles, and it can now accrete particles from the disk one by one. Okay. So this is called the pebble accretion process. So to not to be confused with the streaming instability. So streaming instability is 
really a collective movement. You have uh, trillions of small particles, each of which don't have the way to do anything, but they come together and collectively, by right, their common power, common gravity, form something. Okay. Pebble accretion is an individual process. I'm a big planetesimal, and now I grab particles as they plus close to me, and so I keep growing. Okay. So there is no collective effect anymore. It's just one individual accreting. Uh, so it's still a body, it's still gravity, it's still pebbles, it's still in a disc of gas, but the process is really different. Pebble accretion has a big advantage with respect to the classic models that you find in textbooks of planets growing by accreting planetesimals. In a classical, it was thought, wow, I have many planetesimals. Some planetesimals is bigger than others. Start to accrete other planetesimals, it becomes bigger. Then eventually it accretes all its planetesimals in the neighbor, neighborhood, and that's how a planet is produced. This doesn't work very well. And pebble accretion is much more powerful for two reasons. First, uh, if you have a planet growing accreting planetesimals, the planetesimals have sizes of a few kilometers at least, so they don't migrate in the disk because you remember the curve of the migration speed as a function of size was going down to zero above a kilometer. So once my planet has accreted the planetesimals in its neighborhood, done, right? Uh, then the other planetesimals are too far to be reached and the accretion stops. In the pebble accretion uh, paradigm, this doesn't happen because the pebbles come to the body, come to the planet, because the pebbles individually drift in the disk because of gas drag. So a planet accreting them will never remain isolated because even if the planet accretes the pebbles that pass close to it, other pebbles will come down by gas drag and refill the region. So you avoid the problem of isolation, which was a big, big problem in understanding the formation of the giant planet cores by accreting only planetesimals. And the second reason is that planetesimal accretion, uh, pebble accretion is so much more efficient than planetesimal accretion. And this is explained in this busy plot that I will drive you through. So uh, what is this? This is a planetesimal of original already some size, one of the biggest formed by the streaming instability. And there are two particles coming in. One is another planetesimal, so uh, not very affected by gas drag. And the other one is a pebble, so a millimeter size grain, a centimeter size grain, so strongly affected by gas drag. So what happens? So we are, of course, in the relative frame, in the frame centered on the planetesimal that tries to accrete, is that the two bodies come in and they are deflected by the gravity of the planetesimal. But the other planetesimal, because it doesn't feel much gas drag, it just deflected and goes away. So this is a miss. The central body doesn't grow. But the pebble, even if it comes in exactly on the same orbit, exactly the same impact parameter, exactly the same velocity, because it feels gas drag as its orbit is deflected, will eventually spiral down and be accreted by the central body. So you see that the accretional cross-section of the central planetesimal is much bigger for the pebbles than for the planetesimals. If you want planetesimals to accrete planetesimals, you must be very lucky. You must have a, an impact parameter which is very, very small, and therefore the probability is small. But if you want to accrete a pebble, you can have a much bigger cross-section impact parameter. And the, okay, so now let's come down to the outer plot. This outer plot shows the uh, impact parameter, the accretion, the radius of the accretion cross section, so the distance from, 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 from the planetesimal, at which we can accrete a pebble as a function of the pebble size. But as you see, there are some normalization factors. What are these normalization factors? So, so one is this RB, the Bondi radius is this circle here. The Bondi radius is, the si is defined as the radius at which a particle coming down with a velocity, which is actually the headwind of the disk, uh, is significantly deflected. So it's given by this formula. And the TF is the friction time, so the time uh, it takes for the particle to, to lose its uh, accident velocity relative to the gas, and TB is the time at which the particle would cross the Bondi, ra Bondi radius, the Bondi circle. Okay. So particles which have a Tb over Tf, which is very big, 
means that they have Tf very small, so these are the small particles. And particles which have a Tb over Tf very big means that Tf is very big, so these are the big particles. Okay. Big particles, small particles. I should have put, I know, it's, uh, yeah, okay. So it's big particles, small particles, big particles. I should have put the arrows, I forgot, sorry. So this is the, uh, the, the effective accretion radius. Right. So for an, a, an ideal particle size, where the friction time is equal to the bondy time, so the time required to cross this circle, as you can see, the entire bondy radius, so the accretion radius over the bondy radius is one. So anything that comes down and passes even tangent to this bondy circle spirals down and falls into the central bond. It's a huge accretion cross-section. But if you go to bigger and bigger particles, so towards planetesimals, as you can see, this accretion radius Impact parameter for accretion drops exponentially, and this reflects the fact that for another planetesimal, there are only misses unless the, the impact parameter is almost zero. If the particles are smaller, so this bondy time over friction time is not ideal, uh, the, the accretion cross section decreases, but not very violently, as one over square root of, uh, of the size or something like that. So, to summarize, accreting particles is much more efficient than accreting planetesimals to grow. Because you can accrete planet particles from much further away, so your accretion cross-section is orders of magnitude bigger, and you don't have the isolation problem because particles, because they are drift, are continuously replenished, and you never form a gap in, in pebbles, but you only form gaps in planetesimals. So we now believe and uh, most of the community now agrees on that, that the transition from planetesimals to protoplanets occurs by this process of pebble accretion. So first streaming instability produces planetesimals. Some of these planetesimals, not, not all of them, most are too small, but some can be big enough, or maybe a few small planetesimals can collide and become big enough to start accrete pebbles that flow through the disk, and then they grow bigger and bigger and bigger, and they become protoplanets. That's a very nice view, and I think uh, changes a little bit the, 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 the view that was in the community up to five years ago, and uh, potentially solves a problem. How <coughs> could the cores of the giant planet grow? Because we know that in order to form a giant planet, uh, you need, we need to form, before the gas disappears, planetary cores which are massive enough, or several Earth masses, that are massive enough to accrete the hydrogen and the helium from the nebula and create the giant planets like Jupiter and Saturn. But how to form a 10 Earth mass planet within a couple of millions of years was really unknown until a few years ago. And pebble accretion, for the first time, gives us a model that potentially can do it with reasonable parameters. Things nevertheless are complicated because, yeah, if it were so easy to form giant planet cores, why don't we form them everywhere? Right? And in particular, if you look at the solar system, you see that the solar system has a clear dichotomy, where if in the inner part we have only the terrestrial planets, which are small and rocky, and they formed slowly, at least for the Earth, we know it took tens of millions of years to form. The Moon formed after about 100 million years of solar system history. And in the outer part, we have the giant planets, which are giant, mostly gaseous, and particularly for Jupiter and Saturn. And so they form quickly by definition, because if they had to accrete uh, uh, hydrogen and helium, they had to form within the, before the gas dis disappeared, so say before two, three million years. So we build the things which are 10 times bigger than the Earth in a, in a time scale which is one hundredth of the Earth formation time scale further out and not closer in. So something must happen, right? Otherwise, if it were easy, that's a problem of most theories, right? If you can you study a process like planet formation, then you find it's awfully complicated, and you say, okay, then planets don't form anywhere, so that's not good. Then you come in with a new idea, pebble accretion, say, oh, no, that's it easy, that's efficient. And then you say, okay, now I should form big planets everywhere. And then, then mm, no, I form big planets only in the outer part of the disk and only small stuff in the inner part of the disk. Why? So <clears throat> if the pebble accretion paradigm has a chance to be correct, 
we need to understand at least at the qualitative level where this dichotomy comes from. My point here is that we can, this works, we can understand that uh, following this line of reasoning. So as I said before, in the disk we have a gradient of temperature, so there is a location called snow line within which the temperature is high, so water is in the form of vapor, so the only solids you have are in refractory materials, typically silicates. And beyond the snow line, the temperature is lower, so also I, uh, water is in the form of ice. And they said at the beginning that the sticking properties are such that in a world made of silicates, you should not expect particles to grow more than a millimeter in size. And in a world made of ice, you can expect particles to reach centimeters to decimeters. So, we have different particle size and different particle compositions in the disk. In particular, we may expect that the particles, that solid particles that form in the icy disk, so centimeters to decimeters in size, are actually a collection of uh, silicate grains, millimeter in size, because that's how far silicate can grow, and trained in a matrix of ice. Why not? And when these particles, these particles drift, of course, by gas drag, they drift, 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 and now they come at the snow line. The snow line, ah, it's hot. So what happens when it's hot? The ice goes away. And the ice goes away, you lose part of your solid mass. That's not much according to the solar composition. If you lose all your ice, you lose just 50% of your mass. That's not a big deal. Right? It's just 50%. But it's possible that because you sublimate this matrix that entrains all the grains, the grains actually go away. Right? And uh, so the, the, the pebble, the, the particle, disintegrates in millimeter sized grains. And if instead this is not the case, maybe it's the mutual collisions that once the ice goes away, make this more fragile, and the result is the same. The, the big particles, multi-centimeters in size, break down in a collection of particles which are millimeters in size. And the total mass is comparable, just a factor of two away, but the size is more than an order of magnitude smaller. And pebble accretion is very sensitive on the size. So it's much easier to accrete a pebble if it is centimeters, decimeter in size than if it is millimeter or smaller. So if you have, for instance, imagine two planetesimals, one here, the green one, on the inner side of the snow line, and one here, the red one, on the outer side of the snow line, because the outer one sees a flux of big pebbles and the inner one sees a flux of small pebbles, even if the mass is comparable, just a factor of two difference, simulations show that the inner embryo, inner body grows very slowly, while the outer body grows much more quickly. And so in a given time scale of a few million years, when the outer body can reach 20 Earth masses, the inner one just reaches moon, uh, Mars mass even if at the beginning they were the same mass to start with, in this case, half a moon size for sample of a sake of example. So the dichotomy that we see in the solar system, the fact that big protoplanets of tens of Earth masses could form quickly in the outer disk and become the giant planets, whereas in the inner disk only small planetary embryos, presumably the mass of Mars formed, uh, can come can be explained by pebble accretion. And one takes into account that there is a drastic change of size in pebbles between the outer part of the disk and the inner part of the disk. And, uh, and this is uh, this is quite 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 interesting. So maybe I should say uh, say a word of why we think that in the inner solar system only embryos of the mass of Mars existed by the time the disk disappeared. Uh, this mass of mass of Mars comes continuously when we analyze the terrestrial planets. So first of all, we have Mars. And uh, so some bodies never grew bigger than Mars uh, in, uh, in all evidence. And we know that Mars forms very quickly because again, using radioactive chronometers, Mars is supposed to have finished, complete its growth within the lifetime of the disk, within a few millions of years. Mercury is also small, it's even half of Mars but it lost a big chunk probably of its mantle. But if you restore a sort of a mean planetary composition, Mercury is, has the same mass of Mars. So again, another body that didn't grow bigger than Mars. And then we have the Earth and the Moon, uh, the Earth and Venus, they which are much bigger. For Venus, we don't know anything. For the Earth, we have some uh, 
radioactive constraints on the time scale of accretion. The Earth accretes slowly. Uh, it takes uh, at least 30 million years to reach half an Earth mass. 30 million years is 10 times longer than the lifetime of the gas disk. And then we have the moon forming event, who's dated between 50 and 100 million years, more or less, 120 even sometimes, or much later. And the best models for the formation of the moon say that the moon was formed when the Earth was impacted by a projector with a size of Mars. So again, we find the size of Mars as a recurrent a uh, basic uh, monomer in, in inner solar system formation. So roughly, we can say that in the inner solar system, within the lifetime of the gas, only Mars mass embryos formed. Maybe it was two times the mass of Mars, maybe it was a third. We don't really know, but that order of magnitude. Whereas we are sure that in the outer disk, something at least as big as 10 Earth masses must have formed to become the core of Jupiter or to become the core of, of uh, of Saturn, and indeed this, uh, th this can explain this strong dichotomy. Before we go to the break, I would like to discuss briefly <coughs> some implications for those of you who come more from the geochemical community. Uh, there are some uh, cosmochemists, uh, meteorite people, uh, or all uh, biologists and life. Well, okay, I will then probably not be too much interested on this, but will not take very long. So, people who do analysis of rocks, meteorites, because they come to the Earth for free, or samples that we go collect and cost billions of euros, and I was saying it's meteorites, it doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> so, they know that all the bodies in the solar systems are different from each other. Uh, Mars has a different chemistry from the Earth, has different isotope ratios of the Earth. Meteorites are all different from each other. I mean, one, two meteorites are the same. We say it's the same meteorites, it's the same class, but there are several classes of meteorites that are distinct from each other. They're all distinct from the Earth. They're all distinct from Mars. So it's a, it's a, things are different in the solar system. This should ring a bell. If all bodies accrete from a flow of pebbles, of grains, that come from the outer disk and go to the sun, and some of them are intercepted, some of them are not, they should all be the same, right? Because they all accrete from the same reservoir. And they are not. So you should raise red flags. Wait a second. This process of accretion from small particles drifting in the disk, the streaming instability and pebble accretions are qualitatively inconsistent with the fact that bodies in the solar systems are not the same. Uh, so, if we either we throw away what I told you for an hour, that would be pity because it could, it could <laughs> took you here for an hour for nothing, or we should try to understand how bodies can be different even if they are born from the same flux of material. And this is my goal. Again, some, this is quali quite qualitative sketches, but that's the, what the community is orienting to. So, first of all, you can have two differences differences in chemical composition or different is an isotope composition. Okay, let's look first at the chemical composition. Chemical composition is the ratio between chemical elements, different chemical elements, okay, chemical species. How can we understand the bodies are different? In particular, the bodies in the inner solar system are richer in a refractory material than bodies in the outer solar system. That's because there is a temperature gradient in the disk, hotter in the inner part, colder in the outer part. <coughs> So you expect that pebbles that come from the outer disk have essentially solar composition, so everything has condensed apart from hydrogen and helium. But as these pebbles migrate in, they warm up. And uh, at, uh, there are several locations that they call sublimation fronts at which some species evaporate, sublimates, because it's too volatile. It cannot survive at that temperature. The pebbles are small, are centimeters in size. So the, the temperature of the pebbles become uniform very, very quickly. And so selectively, going inwards, you lose, the pebble loses more and more, I mean, uh, starts to lose first the most volatile elements, and then the less volatile elements, and then the moderately refractories, and at the end, only the very highly refractory elements can survive. So in the past, in the traditional view of why bodies are different, invoked also these transitions, but they were called snow lines, right? Because people had in mind 
a condensation. The an element can condense beyond the given below a given temperature threshold, and then the body that forms there can have that element. Now the situation is reversed. It's the same thing, but these are no more snow lines, are sublimation fronts. It's a change of emphasis, but it tells you everything, right? Or the reservoir of material has everything, all the solar composition except from hydrogen and helium. And by migrating in, it loses selectively the volatile elements from the most volatile to the least volatile through passing through a series of sublimation fronts, you can have only a very refractory the dust grain at the end. And of course, the planetesimal accreting here would be refractory rich, the planetesimal accreting particles at this point would be volatile rich. So that's easy, it's easy to understand. Isotopic differences are more tough. <laughs> And uh, because isotopes, you know, are atoms of different mass of the same element. So they chemically behave the same. So the sublimation temperature is the same wherever I have deuterium in my water or hydrogen in my water, whereas, whereas I have nickel 62 or 64. It's the same. So the scheme before does not work. Still, uh, bodies are different also in isotopic ratio. And in particular, when we look at meteorites, uh, there are two big groups of meteorites, the carbonaceous meteorites and the non-carbonaceous meteorites, which are essentially the ordinary chondrites and the enstatite chondrites, that are very distinct in isotopic diagrams where you put the ratios between, uh, for instance, nickel 62 and 64, chromium 54 and, and uh, something else, 52, anyway, uh, isotope ratios. And they are really distinct. In this diagram, well, you could say, well, this is valley is a little bit artificial. Then you change of isotope system, and you find that now here they are clearly more distinct. And this is chromium, like before, but instead of nickel, we put oxygen, and so on and so forth. They are different in molybdenum, they are different in titanium, they are different in all isotopes. Okay? And they always group in this way. The carbonaceous chondrites are different from each other, but form a continuous group. And the ordinary enstatite chondrites are different from each other by form a continuous group. And interestingly, the terrestrial planets, we know Earth and Mars only, Venus and Mercury are unknown, belong to the non-carbonaceous group and not to the carbonaceous group. So there is clearly divide. Again, if we accreted in the inner solar system the same pebbles that were coming from the outer solar system, why the isotope ratio should be different? It's the same material. And here, so the solution is more convoluted and complicated. <clears throat> but we have to remember that at some point, Jupiter forms. We don't know where, we don't know exactly when, uh, but it, it's a fact that Jupiter forms. Uh, so what happens when a planet starts to become massive enough? When a planet starts to become massive enough, it starts to modify the surface density of the disk of gas. So this is, for instance, a plot, a diagram, from an hydrodynamical simulation shows a planet of 20 Earth masses, so comparable to what should have been the core of Jupiter, in a disk of gas. This is the radial direction, so the sound is down here, the outer disk is up there, and this is the azimuth, so the motion is this way. And the colors represent the density of the gas. So the planet is here, it corresponds to peak of density in the gas. It perturbs the disk, it generates a spiral density wave, which will be so important for migration, as we will see after the break, but also creates a shallow gap. You see here, along the orbit of the planet, the colors are bluish. That means less gas than in the neighboring region, which are green, so more gas. So the density of the gas, the distribution of the density of the gas, starts to be affected when planets reach considerable masses of several Earth masses. And it's not only the density, it's also the velocity of rotate, the, the orbital velocity of the gas around the sun, which is affected. So this is shown in this diagram, which comes together with that. So this is the radial direction. It's this dimension, okay, this direction. The planet is at one. The planet is at one, okay. And here we plot the azimuthal velocity of the gas normalized to the Keplerian velocity as a function of the distance. For three planets of three different masses, 20 in blue, 30 in red, 50 in magenta. So as you can see, far away from the planet, so in this region and in this region, 
the gas is the, uh, less fast than the Keplerian speed. So the gas is sub-Keplerian, is what we've been telling from the beginning, the gas is sub-Keplerian, that white particle by gas drag spiral towards the Sun. But close to the planet, it's a mess because of the presence of the planet and because of this gap that is being opened. And in particular, just outside of the orbit of the planet here, where you have this green over density, this green band neighboring the gap, you find out that the orbital velocity of the gas is actually faster than the Keplerian velocity. That reverses the gas drag. Wait a second. So that means that whereas a particle far from the planet feels a headwind and so slows down and spirals towards the sun, a particle here feels a tailwind, like when you come back from the US on a flight. So it takes two hours less to go back from the States and to go to the States. First, because you are happier when you come back to Europe, but also because of the tailwind. <laughs> OK, finished. Uh, so if the particles here feel a tailwind, tailwind, they tend to go out. Particles here feel a headwind, so they tend to go in. What does it mean? That the particles will spiral in, will come here, and will stop at this point, depending on the mass of the planet, this, this, or this. So a point where the, uh, the orbital velocity of the gas is exactly the Keplerian velocity and they will not go through. So this introduces the concept of the Jupiter barrier. When Jupiter acquired a big enough mass, and it doesn't really matter if it was 20 or 30 or 50, because Jupiter reached eventually 300 within the lifetime of the disk. So it's not a big assumption to you know, assume that Jupiter at some point had one of these masses. It did. Okay? So at some point, Jupiter created a barrier. And when this barrier occurred, uh, the particles drifting from the outer disk could come down only to the or orbit of Jupiter and could not go, go through the orbit of Jupiter. So the material in the planetesimals inside the orbit of Jupiter could not accrete this material coming from the outer disk anymore. And they could only continue to accrete recycled material that could be some pebbles that pass, go to the inner edge of the disk, are thrown out in winds, or are reproduced in mutual collisions or whatever. But the, the, the reservoir of these planetesimals that grow inside the orbit of proto-Jupiter becomes all of a sudden different from the reservoir of these particles that accrete beyond Jupiter. And this can explain the, potentially at least, the big dichotomy in isotopes because, oops, because the source regions are different. So we would say the carbonaceous chondrites accreted beyond Jupiter <coughs> and the non-carbonaceous chondrites are created within Jupiter, and the terrestrial planets, which are also created within Jupiter, obviously share the same isotopic properties of the non-carbonaceous chondrites. Can also explain why the inner solar system is so dry, which is mysterious by itself, because the disk should cool, and eventually ice should be stable even at 1 AU. But if this cools, the snow line moves in, but if my ice is blocked by Jupiter, it doesn't matter. This part of these planetesimals cannot accrete ice because the ice is blocked out there and can only reaccrete the recycled the refractory material from the inner disk. So this, I think, really explains the dichotomy. And very recent work here by Kruger et al. last year in Proceedings of the National Academy of Science using chronology, isotope chronology, in dating the formation of various types of meteorites concluded that this barrier had to have appeared very early, before one million years after the formation of the Sun, so well before the disk disappears. And this is an artist view of this Jupiter barrier. So you have one giant planet, here are several, but one is enough. And then you have a huge amount of dust that tries to spiral towards the star, but is stopped by this um, reversal of uh, speed in, in the disk and cannot go in. And in the inner part, you only have a smaller amount of dust available, which comes from recycling in the inner disk, uh, collisional grinding of first generation of planetesimals, and so on and so forth. And we do observe this situation in many cases. It's called, uh, they are called transition disks. Transition disks are disks that have gas everywhere, because the star is still accreting gas, and we can measure that using spectroscopy. <laughs> but very little dust inside of a big region, and very rich on dust outside of the big region, region. And the typical interpretation is that there is a giant planet blocking dust drift on the way. 
So our conclusion is that yes, the solar system had this shape as well, became a transition disk, became a transition disk when proto-Jupiter formed, and that probably happened within one million years. That's pretty amazing to be able to, to say that so far. And now before going to the break, final teaser from protoplanets to the final system. So if anything of what I said has a chance to be true, you should expect that every system forms with a generic structure. So somewhere there is a snow line. You have big planets outside of the snow line that could, that could be the icy pebbles. A small planets, protoplanets, call them embryos in the in part because they could only create small silicate grains. Okay. And uh, so this should be a genetic structure of any planetary system. It looks pretty good for the solar system. But we have not finished to suffer because there is a process that I will discuss after la, the break, which is migration. When planets grow massive enough, say of the order of Earth mass or multiple Earth masses, as should be the case of the giant planet cores, for some reason, nothing to do with gas drag, something that I will explain after the break, this big planet should migrate. And this, of course, scrambles this order, this universal generic order that accretion should have produced. And this produces a total mess and variety of possible outcomes. And we think, and I, uh, Sean, who will speak after lunch, uh, agrees with me on that, that from the migration mostly, that the big diversity of planetary systems uh, stems out. So I will explain uh, after the break uh, migration, why it works, how it works, and then show how to combine what we know about growth and migration to get something that looks like the solar system. And then Sean in the afternoon will discuss completely alternative paths, alternative paths that do not den deny the, the, the kind of accretion models I showed or the kind of migration models I will show, but simply combine things differently to get a different evolution and then explain the structures of extrasolar planet system. So let's take a break and reconvene later.